All right. Hey, everyone, we're going to get going and I'm sure people will be joining us as we continue right now. Here, I'll spotlight my video. <laughs> um, I'm Cheryl Lazar. Uh, I co-founded Peace Inside Live with Jordana Reem. She's in Thailand. I'm not sure if she's actually here, but um, we provide uh, meditation, mindfulness, and movement daily through donation-based Zoom classes that are interactive with facilitators from around, around the world um, and workshops on the weekend and conversations like this. And um, this is a conversation that's more important than ever before. It's unfortunate that it's, uh, you know, I feel like with everything happening, it's come to this groundswell now when this has been needed for so long. Um, and so we wanted to bring together our community, friends, new friends, um, and family to have a conversation around diversity and inclusion and wellness and uh, also a call to action in terms of what we can do um, because we can all talk and share our thoughts, but it's really about action right now. Um, and I'm so excited because I have someone who I love joining me as a co-host and, we'll, and just to do some housekeeping, um, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Alfie right now. Uh, we're gonna be doing a, a grounding opening meditation. We'll introduce our guests. We're gonna have a conversation and then a QA. and a Then we're gonna do breakout rooms rooms uh, to talk about what we took away from the conversation and actions that we can take from this and then a closing meditation. So we'll, um, this goes from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific. So just a heads up uh, just in case. And uh, it, we want to hear from you. This is interactive. So please uh, put up your, if, you, if there's that, you know, hands up emoji in the Zoom or questions and comments will be going to you in the chat. So Dr. Alfie, uh, I want to introduce her as my co-host right now. Uh, she is amazing. Um, she's an, a very in-demand media expert, keynote speaker, author, and scientist. And she's been featured in a ton of uh, networks, TV shows, radio shows, including mine. Uh, and she is the founder of a mental health nonprofit, The Acoma Project, which has received national recognition for its effective approach to engaging marginalized youth and empowering them to care for their mental health. Dr. Alfie, welcome. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. You, you okay, are. good. So I just want to say hi. I don't want to take up too much time because I'm sitting here with my Calm app um, trying to get my mind centered. And so I'm just really excited to be here with you, Shara. Shara and I met about a year ago, and I feel like she's like my new best friend. Um, we stayed in touch uh, and over all these years. I mean, over all this last year, a little bit over a year. So Feels it's like my you. honor to be here. I know. <laughs> We've worked together quite a few times, which is like really makes me happy um, that these kind of connections can be made for, you know, around mental health and wellness, wellness, wellness specifically. I'm really excited to learn about acupuncture. And like after this, I feel like this coming week or like in the next couple of weeks, I gotta go get acupuncture because it's new to me, but I'm just really excited to have, to be here with Shira, to be here with everyone. Um, and I'm really looking forward to learning and I'm gonna be quiet because I really wanna hear this meditation and I'm gonna participate fully. Amazing. Uh, well, Natalie is here. She's been one of our facilitators at Peace Inside Live. Also, uh, Dalai Lama fellow um, invited one of our guests here today, Betty McGuire. She's been such a, a huge supporter um, and just a great friend. Natalie, welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to see so many beautiful faces and to combine these two amazing worlds. So Dalai Lama Fellow is a global program that the Dalai Lama authorized to train young leaders with Peace Inside Live, which is this amazing response to what we're going through really when you and Jordana launched it to help us all go inside in a time where we're forced to be inside. So thank you all for your time. I'm going to start us off by just grounding us. I was asked to do a grounding meditation. So wherever you are seated or standing, wherever you are, just we're going to drop into our body by allowing our eyes to close. And if we're seated, we're going to connect with the sit bones wherever they're touching the chair or ground beneath us. And as we inhale through our nose, we're going to reach up the top of our head towards the sky. And as we inhale, allowing the belly to fill up with that new air, reaching the belly button out to the world. And slowly as we exhale, dropping our breath down the back of our spine, releasing our shoulders down towards the earth. The hands can be gently placed on the knees or on the lap before you. And keeping the eyes closed, taking another deep inhale through the nose, 
inviting you to recognize the cool air as it enters your body, visualizing this cool air, giving it a color perhaps that you see entering your nostrils, down your throat, filling your heart space, filling your belly. And as you exhale, allowing that breath, that color that you've given this breath to move down through your root, the base of your spine where your coccyx is, allowing this breath to vacate through your root down into the earth. And taking a third breath in through our nose, reaching the top of our head up, visualizing an invisible thread pulling us up from the center of our crown up towards the cosmos as we inhale deeply. And inviting now the color red, a deep red color into your mind's eye as you exhale, bringing this red color down your spine down your root into the earth exhaling any sounds or sighs that need to vacate your body with this red color ah. following that breath all the way out feeling your body vacating from any excess energy that's no longer serving and filling our body, feeling our energy in our body now, taking a moment to connect with every cell, waking up and feeling this new breath. And as we continue to find our comfortable breath, I invite you to open your arms, extending your fingertips, all 10 fingers out in a T-shaped position with your arms. Inhale wide. And as you exhale, bringing our right hand underneath our left armpit, grabbing that left armpit with the right hand. And as you exhale, bring the left hand over and grabbing that right shoulder with the left hand. Finding your own embrace here, breathing in through the nose. Connecting to your heartbeat as the top of your head reaches up towards the sky with your breath, following it down your spinal cord, down through your root. Feeling the sturdy, stable embrace in your own body. Listening to your heartbeat as you gently allow your chin to move towards your heart, honoring the space within you, this grounded, stable, safe feeling of connection. Taking this last deep breath to honor this connection within your own beating heart, your own physical body. And slowly, as you let the breath exhale from your body, slowly allow the hands to let go and slide down onto your lap. Slowly allowing the eyes to flutter open. And focusing on the center of our heart to find ourselves back into this circle, the sacred space for a healing conversation and community. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Natalie. Check out all her work at Avni Healing, underscore healing. Um, she'll share that, I'm sure, in the comments. We'll be sharing all the Instagrams and links to everyone in a follow-up email after this. So thank you again. Um, and now we want to introduce our special guest today, the other Natalie with an H, as we say. Natalie with an H, um, actually was really the one that inspired this after do, um, you know, we have these town halls we do bi-monthly called The Other America, where we bring together storytellers, healers, and activists um, to have conversations around racial uh, race, racism and social injustice and police brutality uh, towards action. And uh, we brought together such amazing community through that. And you know, she said, I, I want to do something like this around wellness. And so she really inspired and brought this all together. So Natalie, um, do you want to introduce some of your friends that you brought in here today who are some of our special guests? And then I'll introduce also who I um, invited and then we'll begin the convo. 
Um, thank you, Tira, and thank you everyone for coming, especially the people I have been emailing constantly. I will start by introducing Karina. I'm gonna spotlight you. Um, Karina Wu, licensed acupuncturist and friend. Karina earned her master's degree with honors at um, Empress College, like a few of us here. Her education continues in the study of Neijing classical acupuncture under Dr. Edward Neal, MD. She has also assisted in oncology and acupuncture research at the Disney Family Cancer Center under Dr. June Kim, licensed acupuncturist, and Dr. Orr Gordon, MD. She now runs her private practice, Tiny Medicine Acupuncture, out of a Rose Garden bungalow in Pasadena, California. And I really invite all of you to check out tiny.medicine on Instagram. Um, she's a proud second generation Chinese American, young adult cancer survivor and advocate, and active member of the LGBTQ community. So Karina, say hi, and we just like love you and welcome you. Um, next is Portia. I'm going to spotlight you, Portia. Oh, there we are. Okay. So Portia, I found through social media. I've never met you in person, but I've just been following you <laughs> as one does online. Um, also a graduate of Emperor's College. She's the founder of Deeper Genius Acupuncture and Healing Arts, a holistic healthcare practice that focuses on providing culturally informed, evidence-based medical and spiritual care to her clientele of brilliant, compassionate, and creative people. Also invite you to check out Deeper Genius Acupuncture. And you, I think you're in downtown LA and open and practicing right now. So if anyone wants acupuncture this week. Uh, I've been downtown LA, but not practicing right now. The office is closed for a bit. Okay. Um, thank you for joining. And next is Nell, Dr. Nell Smircina, um, was my manager at Emperor's Clinic, how I first met Nell. And Nell is an amazing person and um, doctor, doctor of oriental medicine. And that the word oriental is actually something we're going to talk about today. She's an educator, advocate, and practitioner of acupuncture and integrative medicine. Um, she's founder of Peak Wellness, and you can find her at Be Well with Dr. Nell. Um, now you want to say hi, and if I'm like missing things, please, please share more. Um, we have a lot of people, and so I'm just going to keep on rolling. Maritza, um, spotlight you. Maritza is my colleague and friend. She completed her bachelor's degree in biology at University of Chicago in 2014. Maritza was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. She grew up with the intention of serving in healthcare. Living in a low income Hispanic community, she experienced both food deserts and absolute lack of access to holistic medicine within her underserved community. She's now choosing to assess and create shifts in both public health and Chinese medicine. So say hi. Next, we have Sandrina. Let me find you. Also was a manager of mine in a clinic. <laughs> um, yeah, there we go. So Sandrina is also a licensed acupuncturist and founder of The Healing Space. So that is The Healing SP-SE Space, which you can find on Instagram and online. She is a Los Angeles native and also a master's in public health, so an amazing contributor to this conversation. Um, she has an extensive background in public health and social sciences. And I think... Yeah, and then I'll, I'll, I'll continue, um, and then we're gonna dive in. We have Ash Kumra, who's a community builder, global speaker, meditation coach, nationally recognized radio show host, He's recognized by the White House as an entrepreneur making an impact, and he recently launched the meditation app Peak Mindful. I'm an advisor for that, I guess, right, Ash? <laughs> so, Ash, where is where is he at? Oh, am I supposed to highlight? Where is? Hey, where what's is up? At? Yeah, I just want to highlight you, spotlight your video. There, yeah, you, that is Ash. I'm super, I'm super stoked to be here, everyone, and uh, thank you for doing this, Shira. Yeah, of course. Thanks for being here. Now we've got the Jennifer Ailman. Uh, that's how I pronounce your last name, right? 
Just making sure. Lemon. Oh yeah, a lemon. Um, it's so funny. We've only talked once and I, I actually, that was the one thing when we were going through, we were like sound and audio, but I, we've never, um, we've actually never seen each other visually in person. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, she's the founder of Peace Starts Now. It's a nonprofit organization based out of New York City. And their mission is to promote mindfulness by providing yoga, meditation, and creative arts workshops. She's doing amazing work. And um, it's so it's so nice to connect Peace Inside Live with Peace Starts Now. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for being here. Dr. Alfie, as uh, I introduced already, is my co-host, but I'll be going to her after this. Uh, we've got Dr. Milo Dodson, who um, earned his PhD in counseling from uh, and, uh, counseling psychology from the University of Illinois. And uh, he is a senior staff psychologist at the UC Irvine Counseling Center. Where is he? Oh, I have to spotlight you. Where is he? over here um and uh he serves as a liaison to the athletics department and esports program um he's committed uh to advocate for service-based leadership directing hip-hop artists commons dreamers and believers summer youth camp for almost six years um oh my god he has so much stuff i'm trying to like go to the highlights here <laughs> he's writing a book right now he has a podcast with uh, the amazing radio personality who i love yes your tease called mental health is real reflecting empathy and love where they discuss wellness mental health and social justice uh and he's just an incredible person i'm so excited to have him here today glad to be here Shira. dr milo and then finally betty mcguire where is betty um who was brought to us through Natalie. So thank you, it's so nice to meet you. Uh, she teaches children and adult stress management through yoga, meditation, and nature exposure. And uh, she's in Omaha, Nebraska right now, shout out. Uh, and she went to, is it Creighton University with a Master of Science and Health and Wellness Coaching. In the summer, she's gonna complete the Dalai Lama Fellowships year and continue to provide stress management tools to the community. So thank you so much for your time and for being here today. Uh, and now, yeah, thank you. All right, let's get this going because there's a lot of amazing people here. I want to hear from all of you. Dr. Alfie, uh, let's start with you and you're going to get the conversation going. Yes, so it's not going to take me long. I have a really broad question that I would love for any one of our esteemed colleagues to start and weigh in on. It's something that I have been talking about a lot. It's interesting. Dr. Dodson and I have the same degree and we know a whole bunch of the same people. The circles are so tiny. So I'm sitting here thinking about all the people I've worked with at Irvine, whom I've known for years. I have a cousin who's also counseling psych who is a, who came through Irvine's program. His name is Dr. Breland as well, Byron Breland. Um, and Helen Neville, just at, we know like a whole lot of the same people. So I know for his degree, I know that this first question is central to what that training is, and that is about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our field of wellness. That's like really what Counseling Psych is built on. Um, and I, when I say like diversity, equity, and inclusion, Counseling Psych is built on all forms of diversity, equity, and inclusion from differential ability status, from queer LGBTQ, from race, ethnicity, from immigration status. It really tries to attend to all of that. So my question, to all of our esteemed panelists, anybody feel free to start, is really what can we do to do a better job of creating a more inclusive training environment for all the different fields that you all participate in? Because I'll tell you for me, it is heartwarming listening to Sharon and Natalie introduce everyone because what it did for me is say, oh, okay, now I, so I see these different people of different visibly racially ethnic backgrounds in all these different fields. And so I'm always encouraged when I see wellness advocates to um, really support everyone around um, how do we improve our wellness com uh, community and how do we improve education in this community. So I want to start there. Yeah, who wants to go first? Dr. Milo, do you want to go first? Yeah, might as well. Uh, also, just want to say it's great to meet you, Dr. Alfie. Um, Helen was actually my advisor in grad school, so that's a, a beautiful connection there and uh, lots of props to her. Um, one of the goals or one of the dreams that I've always had for multicultural competency training is to make sure that everyone knows that even if you aren't a Black person, even if you aren't a person of color, that you are a multicultural being. And I think sometimes we 
because of the, um, the disastrous history of race in our country, we lose sight of all of our other multicultural identities. And when we talk about diversity, quote unquote, people tend to only think about race. So if we begin to think about ourselves as multicultural beings, we can move into spaces and train around how we identify and not just focus on the what or the check marks that we have, but who we are as holistic humans. So, you know, when, when I do particular diversity and inclusion trainings, um, my main focus is actually increasing more of a sense of belongingness. Uh, so the I or the inclusion part, if you will. Um, but I also think that it's important to tap into the strengths of multiculturalism instead of approaching it from a deficit model. A lot of people tend to focus on a lack of diversity. Um, so I think there's lots of room to improve trainings um, and also approaching it from being a lifelong learner instead of just a quick like, all right, cool, I went to this weekend seminar. Uh, I'm a multicultural expert all the time. So it has to be consistent. It has to increase self-awareness and it also has to be uh, self-reflective. So I'll let other, awesome. other people That's jump. That's awesome. And one thing I would just answer. interject for you all, as you answer the question, I'm wondering if you can also talk to us a little bit about how in your specific field, what are the things that you're seeing that allow, that have been really helpful in terms of centering these issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in training specifically? And I don't want to leave out, I know something's really important for this period in time, it's how we deal with people's traumas, right, around race, ethnicity, um, and other points of inclusion. So please be thinking about that too as you answer the question. Um, I'll chime I will in. chime in. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. No, please, go ahead. <laughs> Same time. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sandrina. I'm a licensed acupuncturist here in Los Angeles. And um, one thing that is really like on top for me right now in regards to the whole like wellness industry and talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion within wellness is kind of taking a step back first and thinking about who defines wellness? What does wellness look like to black people, Latino people, indigenous people, um, LGBTQ communities? What does that look like for us? Um, because we know that wellness has you know, there's this unspoken thing that it's very a white thing, a white trendy um, type of lifestyle, and it doesn't necessarily lend itself to welcome other people who are not white or female uh, for that matter. Um, so thinking about that, first of all, um, and then also acknowledging, you know, the practices within wellness right now, whether it be yoga or meditation or people trying gua sha or jade roller you know um and realizing where those things come from um they are rooted deeply in traditional practices um, that are outside of the western world um and we have to consider you know the history of cultural appropriation um in trying to be well uh in the western world and when we're thinking about diversity equity and inclusion um we also have to think about the history of the, the trends that are being adopted currently, even amongst Black people and Latino people and other communities, um, and pay respect to that and acknowledge where certain things come from so that as we try to move forward, we also want to understand um, the roots and where we're coming from in regards to living a healthier lifestyle, trying to be more well, um, and finding a way that we can define that for ourselves and not having this hegemonic idea of what wellness is and what it should look like uh, for people. Um, so I would just throw that out there. Um, but to also answer the question, um, I think first acknowledging that too, and then second would be, um, like Brother Milo said, you know, awareness, self-reflection is key um, because we're individuals who make up a collective. So if we're not taking care of ourselves, if we are not um, being truthful with who we are as an individual, as a human being and our identity, where we hurt, where we may be hating 
um, and deal with those things and deal with past traumas, if we're not dealing with that, then we cannot be well collectively. Um, and then we can't be open to learning how to be more um, inviting of other groups that look like that, like look like us, or don't look like us, or even have the same background and experiences as us. Um, so doing a lot of self work is definitely key um, in fostering an environment of that's diverse and more inclusive. Um, and within the field of acupuncture, uh, traditional Asian medicine as a whole, I would say uh, Pandora's box is opening up as we speak. <laughs> it's not something that's been taught or really um, acknowledged within the field. And um, it's much needed and things are starting to open up and discussions are starting to be had and questions are being asked as we speak. So, um, yeah, uh, and we're here to, to open it up and to foster those conversations and to bring about more change in, in diversity and inclusion within the acupuncture profession here in the West. So I can't really speak onto what specifically has been done historically, but I know that things are opening up right now. And my other colleagues who are acupuncturists, please chime in. Um, if there's something specifically that you know that has been done previously um, in, the, in regards to that area. Well, that was really great. Thank you so much, Sandrina, because I, um, I wanted to also touch upon the idea that we, it, within self-reflection and within um, celebrating the multiculturalism that does exist within America, within wellness, and my background is also in, in acupuncture for anyone that um, doesn't know, I think it's really important to assess when we, to assess and separate wellness from commodity, especially in a world like the US where everything is kind of commodified. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that like when we do, like you were saying, a lot of the internal work to know that wellness really shouldn't be something that we kind of have started to moralize over time. like. In the, in the way that it exists in like capitalist society, there is like wellness, there's white wellness, there's a wellness that is moralized in the fact that if you can do this for your children, if you can do this for your body, you are good and you are doing well, um, which isn't the case at all. This type of self-care, this type of care for the community and the environment is something that should be essential and is essential. And if we're looking at the tenets of Chinese medical philosophy, it should exist for everyone and within everybody. So one of the things that I think is really important when I'm trying to create inclusive training in my environment and wellness is also to just recognize because we grew up in this world where commodifying everything just seems normal, but it's, mm -hmm. it's not and it shouldn't be in this situation. So just being able to identify the differences, I think is a good, really good first step. I think Portia was wanting to talk. I saw oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No, after, meaning I'm just making sure that she, because, you know, that uh, she shares right now. <laughs> I think you guys have brought up really brilliant points and I would like to add in terms of um, in terms of how we can better integrate um, cultural competency into our I'm an acupuncturist as well into our medicine into the holistic field. I think we also have to really consider a holistic approach and consider the interconnected of interconnectedness of um, having cultural competency and making sure that our work um, doesn't lend toward performative allyship, that we're looking at the at these trainings and we're looking at this education as an integral necessary part of wellness in general, that this is, um, you know, we're talking about human rights concerns. We're not talking about a, um, you know, an extra course to help some people like, right. When we get this education, when we share this information, we are actively working towards better human rights for all of us um, and specifically for the groups that are affected. So I think it's really important that we, we make sure that our, um, our education and our efforts don't lean toward a performance of being helpful and are actually rooted in um, humanizing this process and realizing that we have a duty to, um, to, support, to support the most marginalized among us. Can someone quickly just tell us, give us a quick one, two sentence definition of cultural competence? Because I'm not sure that people always know what we mean when we say that. Anyone? 
so my <laughs> so my um, my understanding of cultural competency is um, having having a um, nuanced lens and understanding of various cultures um, and being able to respectfully engage with a, I will, for instance, I will use a practitioner relationship, and be able to respectfully and intelligently engage that person and their boundaries and have a, at least a baseline understanding of where they are coming from culturally. And if you don't mm -hmm. have an understanding, having um, the wherewithal within yourself to respectfully approach, inquire when necessary and be able to receive feedback, you may get it wrong and that's okay. And we have to be, we have, as practitioners, we have to be able to be comfortable with saying, I got it wrong, apologizing, doing better, um, and then really, and really kind of making space to understand that there, there's so much nuance and so much variety in terms of, of people's experiences and identities, and that we should definitely have, as practitioners, a very ba at least a baseline understanding of that and be willing to um, and appropriately engage our, our um, patients so that you know, we're not perpetuating violence toward them from a place of ignorance or privilege or entitlement. Thank you. And I know- and That was more I, than one or two, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I love that. Thank you for that response. And I know uh, Jennifer has such an amazing story of how she started her nonprofit uh, from her own background of how mindfulness has really helped her and that informs um, how she's doing what she's doing, what she's wanting to bring to the world. So I don't know if you want to speak to that, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, sometimes I kind of like fall back a little bit and kind of see, but I'm really grateful just to share. Um, so I, um, just a little bit about me. I grew up in the Bronx. Um, I grew up in a one single family, uh, sorry, single income household, um, very much in poverty, um, you know, a little bit about my personal story. I used drugs for a really long time. Um, and that's what I had access to in the neighborhood that I lived in. Um, I didn't actually attend my first yoga class until I was about 18. Um, and then I, when I started doing yoga and meditation, I realized how healing it was. Um, obviously I used drugs to really like, uh, cope with a lot of the trauma that I was experiencing. Um, and I got a lot of those workshops for free at the school that I was attending. Um, and when I left college and I ultimately um, got uh, clean, stopped using drugs, I wanted to start um, doing more meditation and yoga. And I realized I couldn't afford the classes that were being offered at, at the studios that I would find um, just because I just, you know, I was working, but like, I, you know, we, we were still in poverty. I was helping my mom pay bills and trying to just help my family and paying school and all this stuff. And I just couldn't afford it. And I got so angry that like, this just wasn't accessible to someone like me. And so um, uh, this fire inside of me started uh, where I just felt like there was just this huge, um, you know, like gap between services um, of someone like me. And so I founded Peace Starts Now with the intention that mindfulness should be free and accessible um, to people uh, you know, in vulnerable communities and vulnerable populations. And so, you know, it's amazing because a lot of the work that I do is just donation based. Um, actually, we offer free services to people who are, who are vulnerable and any kind of for prof profit proceeds, you know, for kind of regular, you know, people who can attend, but all of the um, partners that we have that we're offering like free services too is like people who are um, recovering um, drug addicts or older populations, people in low income communities. And so we, we provide this service knowing that it's not accessible. And so I think really, um, you know, a few things kind of come to mind. Like I studied to become a meditation instructor last year. I just became a Reiki practitioner and uh, the programs that I went through were very expensive. And so I recognize my own privilege in being able to afford uh, to become a Reiki practitioner, afford to go to college, afford to um, become a meditation instructor. But um, what about the people out there that don't have the access to the money to do that? And so as I just raised this question, like as a wellness facilitator, or someone who's in the wellness movement, like how can we make, um, you know, the services that we provide, right? And this is just an open-ended question. How can we make these services accessible to people who want to be, let's say, want to be a Reiki 
practitioner but don't have hundreds of dollars or a thousand dollars to do that so um are we are we going to offer scholarships um are we you know like what are we doing um as leaders in the wellness movement to also like kind of allow the things that we teach and allow the services that we provide to be accessible to everyone so i mean it, it's so important um it's really important because not everyone you know and it's not a matter of race um you know i feel like anyone who's growing up and has barriers you know uh might also just need kind of the gap like to be closed so how can we um facilitate that i don't know that's just kind of an open-ended question we can like chat about it more um but yeah i mean i i am definitely an advocate on making these services accessible to everyone um and also trying to see how i can provide it and teach others how to do that as well so thank you thank you jennifer I just want to, I think Maritza would have yeah, Maritza. you to contribute, spotlight you. Hi, yes, um, I wanted to add on to that and also tying in to the initial question. We are not taught, uh, so I'm currently a student at Burris College also studying acupuncture and we are not taught a business model or financial model to support these low income communities, which is also where I come from just like you do, Jennifer, um, where there are no holistic services available to these communities because we're trained that you were supposed to charge more for these services. And to me, I see the biggest need and the biggest epidemic in terms of health and the root of all chronic disease in these communities and no one is addressing that. Um, and I think part of the problem is that we're not trained. How do we offer this? How do we do a community setting offering to the people that are in need of education in terms of what food do you eat and how do you take care of yourself and how do we prevent anyone from going into a chronic disease um, as well as how do we allow them to feel like they are capable and empowered by paying for that medicine themselves. Um, I personally, working on researching, um, trying to figure out how to be of service to that community, you know, that's where I come from and I see the huge need and that's where true preventative medicine can function for these communities. Uh, but uh, I think that the root of the problem in terms of education is that we are not trained to support communities in the sense of finances. If I could add I would, on to that. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay. No, thank you. Um, I, first, Jennifer, I wanna say thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, that was just incredibly vulnerable of you and just incredible to hear um, what you've done. Uh, but to add to what you had said and what Maritza was saying, I think we need to first look at that personal accountability because no one person can do everything, but everyone can do something, right? So, you know, when I was working at Empress College as the clinic manager, I saw a lot of that back end that Maritza was talking about as far as, you know, we're not taught these things in school. So it's on the schools to do a better job at educating. You know, I also have uh, my background in acupuncture and uh, traditional medicine. And you already feel like you're learning a whole new culture and new language if that is not your traditional culture. Um, but there are real life implications to not learning cultural competency while you're in school. There are real life applications to not understanding the needs of the community that you are going to be going into practice in. Um, right now, I'm fortunate to serve as the president of CISOMA, which is California's oldest acupuncture association. And the discussion has been, okay, well, what is our ownership in this? You know, we understand the demographics of our profession, um, but as a professional association, how do we help? And part of that is making sure that practitioners are supported and they're getting reimbursed properly, that they're properly educated, that they do have the privilege to serve in whatever community that they want to serve in and still be able to care for themselves and their family. And I think that's what ties into this whole idea of, you know, self-care and community care. If you can't take care of yourself, it's very hard 
to serve a community. Um, so as a professional association, it's our job to make sure that we're working on these health disparities and making sure that there is access to care. And that goes for me as a practitioner as well. You know, I am very fortunate to have a cash practice, but then I spend time doing pro bono work. And if I wasn't able to support myself financially, I wouldn't be able to drive downtown every week and treat at a low income clinic or to take a day or two off to serve the veteran community. So I think in, it's something that we all need to say, okay, what power do I hold? Um, and then how can I use that to help contribute to this issue? I love what you said, Dr. Nell. I think it's spot on. Um, also going back to what, excuse me, Maritza and Jennifer also spoke to. So I'm wondering as we think about bringing in Ash and um, Betty, I'm sorry, um, making sure that you all come into the conversation. I always think about also there's this piece of this that has to do with systemic oppression and structures. There are structures that keep people from having access. So access and lack of access and health disparities are not always just about how much money you have, right? Because you look at the statistics that talk about rates of obesity in African-American, Black, and Latinx communities up and down the SES spectrum. You think about uh, low birth weight and, and just other kinds of health issues, uh, infant mortality. It doesn't matter whether you are educated, Black or Latino or not, you still are facing these issues. So I'm just wondering, what are the responsibilities or what are some of the issues, Betty and Ash, um, as you contribute, if there's anything you can speak to that has to do with your thoughts on the systemic issues, right? It's not just in the people, it's also in the systems that keep people out of care, keep people out of training, prevent people from being able to do the kinds of things that they would like to do in wellness. We're interested in your thoughts. I think Betty is trying to maybe unmute herself. Yeah, uh, thank you, I appreciate. Um, the invitation to the conversation. What's coming to mind for me as I listen is um, the importance of individuals knowing themselves. And I think that's true for our patients and for us as practitioners. Um, I should say patients and clients, we all kind of do different things here. So um, I think what is systemic about this, per one thing that is systemic about this particular issue is that we are not encouraged to trust our own intuition and our own knowledge and our own insight in the world of wellness. It's, I think maybe from the traditional um, or the conventional medicine perspective, I should, I should be more specific. My training is sort of more um, from that direction. And coaching is, health coaching is designed to put the power back into the patient's hand or the client's hand. So we're trained to redirect um, their focus on waiting for something from their medical system or from their, their wellness guide and um, encouraging them to reach deep inside and find that internal motivation and trust that they have the tools that they need to get where they need to get. And then also, we're also trained to meet them where they're at right now. So regardless of their background and, and who they are, um, we, I shouldn't say regardless, I maybe we consider their background and who they are and we consider those strengths and getting from where they are to where they wanna be. So there's always um, in the coaching relationship, there's the conversation is always around um, what are your goals? What do you need to reach those goals? What is it gonna take? How can I support you? How do you wanna be held accountable? Um, and, and do you wanna be held accountable for me? So there's a lot of conversation about the power that the client or patient has and sort of reconditioning them to know deep in their heart that they can plan their own path to wellness with the help and support of their um, healthcare professionals that they're working with. Yes, uh, Dr. Alfie Poe is like spot on. I'm looking at the comments. The comments are great if you're ever wondering what people are saying or thinking. Um, and I, I wanna also um, talk to Ash because I know he needs to jet soon and get his take on what we've been talking about. Is Ash there? Did he drop off? I think, 
dropped off, Shira. Oh, there we. All right, so we won't go to Ash right now. <laughs> um, yeah, Dr. Alfie, you can continue and also respond in any way you want to because I know you had some thoughts from the chat. No, just I, I feel like everybody addressed the major things that I wanted, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm mindful of our time. Um, I know we have a schedule that we want to keep, and so I guess the last thing I'll ask is, to me, this is a really important question. They all are, but. This idea of a couple of our experts talked about cultural appropriation. Um, and one of the things we were curious about is the cultural appropriation of something very specific. And that is traditional Asian practices um, and other cultural practices in this day and age where those of us who are not familiar, now it's sort of the end thing to do um, is to kind of jump on board with some of these traditional practices. And so I'm wondering if any of our colleagues want to speak to us about how do we make sure that we do that in a way that's not trendy and that respects, as people have shared, respects the tradition, respects the culture, respects the origins of, you know, Betty talked about our intuition, right? That respects the intuition, respects the, I don't know, the foundation of many of these practices and thinking very specifically about traditional Asian healing practices. Any thoughts for any of our colleagues? No. Dr. Nell. Well, I'll say something. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoever, I can't see you. Go ahead. It's Sandrina. Okay. Um, this is an active conversation I'm having uh, with my professional colleagues and then also with friends and patients and stuff like that. Um, I think that acknowledging first you know the origin of the practice the medicine the treatment whatever it is acknowledging its origin and um expressing appreciation for it um and not um commodifying it as karina mentioned earlier um you know i saw an ad on Instagram yesterday and it was a um I think it was like a jade roller or something or a, some a gua sha tool and it was the company advertising it but it didn't call it that it didn't it didn't call it that at all it said what are the benefits of this tool thing and it can do this and it can do that but it was using more like western terms and I just commented on it and I was just like um, please acknowledge the origin of this of this traditional practice and where it comes from. And then I explained that it's this is based in you know traditional Chinese um, healthcare practice. And I went on about it, but I just see it so much where you know there's the history of like the Graston method or something, and it's the same thing as gua sha on the body, but it's been appropriated and repackaged and renamed as something else and marketed as this whole, this new thing. Um, <laughs> and it just kind of blows my mind, but the, the level of disrespect um, when it comes to other groups of people learning about things that they may have never known before. But then I like to call it Columbusing and acting like, oh, you just discovered this and all of a sudden <laughs> it's yours and it's not. <laughs> um, so I don't, if you want to use something, I've, I say educate yourself about it, you know, learn about it, read about it from the origin of the source, um, and then acknowledge where it's from. Don't try to rename it, don't try to rebrand it, don't try to re whatever it's, like take it for what it is. Um, and use it if it's ancient use it now in this modern time but don't try to remodernize it for some other kind of like ooh brand new trendy use um so respect acknowledging the origin informing yourself and becoming educated about it that's, that's my very helpful <laughs> karina or dr nell i know that you all have uh, you practiced in ways that are very rooted in traditional asian practices and eastern practices so i'm wondering if you all have thoughts as well yeah um, I'll go. Uh, I loved what Sandrina said because it goes back to the root of what I always say is like, okay, what's your personal accountability? I love that, you know, you went and you were like, well, let me give you some background on this because I think as those of us who are educated on certain things, it's our responsibility to continue to educate. 
Um, this is something that comes up a lot uh, it, with the professional association I work with because as we're talking about trying to help mainstream this medicine so that more people can have access to it, there's always that fear and that risk that some of the tradition or the spirituality or the nuances that were brought here to the US could get lost in that. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Asian medicine is a complete system. And, you know, we're looking at it from, oh, like what reimbursement codes are gonna work for what? And, mm. oh, we'll cover acupuncture, but we're not gonna cover herbs. And it's really difficult to work within the contextual framework that we have in this country and keep those traditions alive. But I think it goes back to what Sandrina was talking about. Like I, I can celebrate that people are getting grass and technique from Kairos because of course they're getting relief, but it would be wonderful if they're also being educated that that is a traditional Eastern medicine modality that's actually called Guasha. And this is, you know, the historical aspect of that and, and why that matters. I definitely agree with Sandrina and Dr. Nell. It's always super important when it comes to any type of cultural appropriation to always credit the history, but I also, I feel like this is just going to be the theme of things that I talk about today is to, to kind of discuss that one, the culture is credited, but that if money is made from it, especially with things like washa and jade rollers, um, coming up in the beauty industry, which like has a pretty problematic history of, of benefiting off of other cultures, mm -hmm. um, that, that money, if money's made for it, at least in part, some of its funds finds its way to supporting the people that are actively engaged in talking about the history of the medicine. And also that they credit it and they talk about it and are educated. And like Dr. Nell said, it is part of our responsibility as practitioners to educate people when we can. But if, if they're not also putting money that they've earned from selling gua sha, jade rollers, tools like that, the very least that they can do is making, is to make sure that the money that they're contributing, that, the, that they make is not contributing to a system that suppresses the culture that it actually comes from. Um, which like beauty in itself is inherently so Eurocentric, at least right now, um, and historically has been. So I think that's just an important thing to acknowledge. Yeah, I want to know how each of you, because like I know uh, Dr. Milo did this so well with uh, the company that I work with, Radio.com, how as we were having more conversations around what's happening right now, he came in and did a presentation. Are each of you working on the corporate level or to bring this to um, these ideas and um, wellness to also corporations? Because if these are places that we're consuming from or getting our information from and they themselves have a lack obviously of diversity or just a lack of a sense of wellness and consciousness, it's that um, is a domino effect to uh, audiences and communities as well. Uh, Dr. Milo, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, yeah sure thing. So um, what's always important to note here is that when you focus on the person, performance improves. So in companies, people are like, all right, cool, let's do diversity because it's going to help us with job performance or it's going to help us with productivity. And a lot of times, I think my initial conversations with companies are about, hey, let's focus on the person just for the sake of focusing on the person. It's not like a, if we talk about wellness, if we talk about diversity, then all right, cool, our bottom line is going to increase. It's like, no, 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 you should care about people just because like that's a human thing to do. So when we're talking about um, diversity in the workplace, yeah, it's innovative and yeah, it can lead to a diverse uh, you know, array of ideas and concepts and contributions, but it's also working through to create a culture of compassion and care so people can just live. Um, the other thing that's important to talk about tied, to, tied into what we were talking about before is the stigma around mental health, particularly with me as a psychologist, and a lot of people aren't understanding what mental health is and how real burnout is, how real social loafing is. So these concepts that people may, you know, right off as people are just being lazy actually ties into diversity because if I myself as a black man in a company aren't feeling heard or understood, 
one, I'm not going to feel motivated, which also looks like me potentially having depression, which means that my job productivity is not going to be that high. So it's all connected together. And the last thing I'll share here is that diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts need to be more of an ongoing um, uh, effort and need to be woven in into the tapestry of a company instead of just like, all right, cool, we did this this week, moving right back to other business. Um, it needs to be consistent and it needs to be ongoing instead of being looked at as like a final destination to just get to. Yes, I love that. And if any of you have brands you work with or companies, Dr. Mello has an amazing um, presentation in the work he does. It's just incredible. So I'm always recommending uh, him and what he does. And like, what is your take on, like we all know that, uh, that communities um, need this, communities who don't, can't afford it. Are we supposed to rely on governments and like the city council, like budgets from these communities to then provide these communities? Are we supposed to rely on nonprofits? Are we supposed to rely on like um, everyone being volunteers? Like I'm trying to figure out the systems um, so that we can get uh, these tools to more people who need them. Does anyone have anything to say around that? Yeah, I, um, I've worked with a few other practitioners and um, a few other um, concerned community members who essentially have viewed getting this wellness into people's hands as a form of reparations. And so they have collected um, funds from their community members and people who are privileged enough to um, to have to be benefit from our society as is to um, to acquire some of those funds and to put them into pots and to distribute them to practitioners to offer um, these services for free or discount. I think a lot of times what we're running into in wellness is we're trying to solve this problem. And what's happening is, is we're asking practitioners to kind of work for free or work for less and essentially go through burnout. When we very well know that we don't have to operate in a scarcity mentality, we know that there is um, plenty to go around and that um, those who are most uh, benefited by structures as they are should definitely um, provide forms of reparations and you know, pay folks to, to have the access to this wellness. It's kind of a a really simple way to go about it. I agree with Portia. And one of the things I want to add, this is an example that I like to use from research. And I think that we, I want us to be empowered. One of our colleagues said it earlier, I think it was Betty, be empowered to use our own knowledge and skills um, to move the conversation forward. So one example is in the research space, right? We have the National Institutes of Health that's funded by guess what? American tax dollars. And so all the biomedical, right, I put that in air quotes, all the biomedical innovations, a good portion of them come from the NIH. Yet you have these significant racial disparities in who gets to lead, right? The government gives people like Dr. Milo, like myself, like any of our colleagues money when we apply, million, literally millions and millions of dollars, right? With the idea being that the brightest minds are going to push um, these new medical innovations forward. The problem is that there's this funnel that not all of us have equitable access to in terms of who gets those research dollars to conduct the research studies. And so in some ways, the government pays for the innovation, right? That's how we get the, the, we get the research dollars into the academic institution's hands. We get these leaders who are like, I won't say almost never, but where, for example, the National Institute of Mental Health 1% of the principal investigators who run these studies are African-American, 1%, right? We're all, everybody on this call paying taxes. And so we don't have equitable access. And so I say that as an example to say, Shira, to your point, that the government already does this kind of stuff. So we're not asking for anything special by asking for the government to support public-private partnerships to push forward wellness and, and health and mental health is my thing specifically. So as you all are talking about this and giving your answers, I want to encourage all of us to be thinking about the fact that we're not asking for anything special. We're not trying to create anything unique. All this stuff already exists in systems and what we really want is to open the systems, to give people equitable access, to make sure that acupuncturists, right, and nutritionists and life coaches have the same access to funding 
everybody else has. So please do contribute kindly. But I just wanted to throw that in there because it was just like, it was like itching. I was like, I had to get it out. Any other, uh, other of our special guests have anything to share on that or what they're seeing work or any ideas that they're like are bubbling up in their minds about it, please let us know before we get into more kind of town hall Q&A feedback conversation. Yeah, I just, I just want to say I just really love the topic of this um, as the founder of a nonprofit that does free workshops. Um, it can be very challenging because a lot of the tests, especially in the beginning, I was offering these workshops for free um, and, you know, like in terms of not making any any proceeds for myself or I was working with yoga instructors and trying to or meditation instructors and trying to figure out like how can I pay them if I'm paying them am I, pay, am I paying them out of my own pocket so where is that funding coming from um, so it's just it's so important because as um, someone in the a, a nonprofit leader you know there is a lot of pressure because you know we're the ones that are supposed to be out there like saving babies and like you know helping communities but um you know, like, uh, how are we also supposed to get that? And, you know, I guess grants and, and foundations, but I, I really love just what was said before, um, you know, not having certain access to, to that millions of dollars and, and things like that. So I don't know, I just, I, I think it's so important just to be talking about this and just figuring out like how, like who is really responsible um, and, you know, the, the, the go-to people, like, you know, especially as a nonprofit leader, like, you know, it, there is a lot of pressure to kind of like, you know, fill the gaps. But, you know, I think everybody really needs to take on some responsibility, even having a conversation like this. Um, you know, we all have to kind of be our own leaders and talking about why um, wellness is important, why, um, what are the benefits? And, you know, again, like to what I said earlier, like how can we provide these services and make it accessible to everyone? Um, so um, that's all I want to share. Thank you. Right. And I, I will one add, thought. Oh. It's really quick, Sandra. Is it okay if I share real quick? Go ahead. Uh, there's also city and state purchasing. So depending on the city state that you live in, you could reach out to your local government and see like online, they list different um, contracts that they have. And some for bigger cities, Omaha, there's not a lot of stuff for the health and wellness field, but bigger cities, I can imagine, that the cities and states are reaching out looking for wellness practitioners and they might want to, they might have a preference for who they're giving that money to. So it'd be worth getting creative and um, yeah, try to find out if your local um, government is looking for you, looking for a practitioner like you. Yeah, thank you. That, yeah, that's um, really important to know. And I know who, someone else was wanting to, was talking, Sandrina. Oh, yes. Um, just in in the realm of access as well, um, not even for practitioners and funding, but also um, if we're going to be, you know, wanting to bring this medicine to groups who don't normally have access to it, we also have to think about location as well. Because um, I can speak to here and being in Los Angeles, most of the quote unquote alternative wellness, holistic healthcare is all on the west side. Santa Monica, Culver City, Beverly Hills, Malibu, all of that is heavily concentrated. So the more east you go in to the city, um, it's less and less. Um, so we individually have to be intentional about where we locate our practices as well if we are trying to be more accessible and reach um, a diverse demographic um, within the wellness um, field. Um, I will say that for myself, I live in South LA and I was trying to open up my practice in South LA and I was met with some a various number of bar barriers and I was very upset about it, still am, but not as upset. Um, but I was blessed to find a location that was 20 minutes from um, South LA, which is, is reasonably accept accessible, but it's not my ideal location. Um, and I'm going to continue to fight to make sure that I get closer into my community because I want to serve um, Black people. So no matter what the economic um, uh, level is, I want to be accessible and be like, I'm here. <laughs> you come see me. 
Um, but there are issues with location and uh, things like that and us individually having to be intentional about that as well. So I will just throw that out there in regards to the accessibility conversation. I mean, I know we have a, a lot of different uh, people right here in the community and the industry and people have been really active in the chat and I want to kind of open up the conversation. Terrence has been saying a lot of awesome things. If you want to, uh, to you know, go on camera, turn your mic, um, uh, unmute it so you can share what you've been talking about. That'd be great. Of course, if you want to, no pressure. <laughs> See you there. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm by my window and my neighbor's children are having a ball outside, so I might get some interference. Um, I mean, basically, you know, I think it was self-explanatory in the chat. Hold on one second. Hey. I think it was, was self-explanatory in the chat because, you know, I think that when we talk about uh, uh, healing, we have to go back to the root and try to once again learn some things from that. A lot of what we talked about, you know, has uh, origins, you know, and derivations from that root. Um, I don't know if there was anything specific uh, you wanted to speak to that was in the chat. Um, well, no, you were just bringing up so many different things of um, comedic practices, and I don't know, like. Uh, What's your background here? What in interested you in coming here today? And is there anything you want to bring up for conversation or to ask? Well, I uh, have worked in uh, local and international education and community building for many years. And uh, what I mentioned in the chat is just um, personal study, you know, for personal health. Just like when I talked about cultural and human competency and responding to what Dr. Alfie said about, you know, the institutional, I think there are a lot of things we have to get outside of the institutional, the institution, you know, um, because of how it is. And uh, I think that's the way it should be, <clears throat> you know, as far as personal study. I think we gain more, we learn more, <clears throat> you know, we're not required, you know, to learn things as in, in the institution. I think the best learning as we may all agree, occurs outside of the institution. I think the institution for me is kind of foreign in the sense that, you know, I advocate for more natural learning, more lifelong learning. And so when you talk about the holistic comedic practices and spiritualities, you know, uh, that's what it means to me, you know. Um, you know, I just, I, just, I just think that, you know, if we're talking about health, uh, it should be mentioned a whole lot more. It should be studied a whole lot more because once again, we're dealing with the origin. We're dealing with the roots, you know, of where these things come from. Even when you mentioned perhaps, you know, Chinese or Asian uh, medicine. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for being part of this. We appreciate it for your contribution. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, Phil also brought up an interesting point, if you want to turn your video or mic on, so I'm not just spotlighted myself as you talk. <laughs> Where are you at, Phil? Oh, there we are. Do, uh, feel free to put your video on if you want, or not. Yeah, I'm right here, sorry. <laughs> there you are, okay. Uh, so yeah, you brought up something interesting. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, um, I've just done, I, a little background about me, I've done, um, I worked for an HIV AIDS nonprofit for six years where we dealt with, uh, specifically with um, minority communities. I did a lot of work in the South and I know that faith-based communities have a lot of influence with legislators, with the local community uh, government leaders, with a lot of them actually speaking and having influence. And I just didn't know, you know, with everything that's going on, it's, uh, you know, people are going to the church and their faith in the networks are being more integral and in incorporated. And I just don't know if anyone's ever thought about incorporating this, because I know Dr. Alfie has a nonprofit that addresses this kind of topic. And I've done stuff from like Norfolk, Virginia, down to like, you know, Jackson, Mississippi. And so a lot of communities want access to this. They don't know about it as well. 
do any of our colleagues have any of you all done as philip has mentioned work with unique communities like faith communities i know maritza had something to say about that with her experience with her father i saw yeah so my father um has been working uh for a couple years now via the catholic diocese of el paso um supporting with any sort of issues that any immigrant may have whether they need shoes they need food they need shelter uh, so we had actually talked about um having one of our teachers from emperor's college and doing a volunteer uh trauma relief clinic at the borders uh but COVID happened and that kind of got our initial initiative shut down but i know like acupuncturist without borders was also considering jumping in on board with that as well uh, so I, I think it's definitely untapped um, and it could be a huge uh, avenue for supporting underserved populations. I, I Just to jump on, because I know a lot of faith-based community churches in the South do health fairs and it's a way to actually get the communities to uh, be more aware of their health. And um, one thing that I saw in all these health fairs and all the times that I was going around to these churches was there was, well, again, it's the South, but there was no, you know, representation of this, of any type of alternative medicine because it is a church-based thing. And so you really need to work with the leaders to break that stigma of the woo-woo of a lot of the stuff and actually have them understand. You're laughing because you know it's true. <laughs> because, it's, yeah. because it's true. And so, but you know, because when I left my organization to pursue this, uh, career in alternative medicine and, you know, waiting to take my exam for the acupuncture board. But it was actually a lot of my team, because I had a team of 27 people reporting to me throughout the South, all um, African Americans, all um, in the deep South who didn't understand the medicine or why I would go to alternative medicine, but they understand the perspective when you talk to them on a level of how it helps the body, how it incorporates it, and how this wellness is not a woo-woo, but it actually helps things. Like when we had to do HIV testing, for example, we had to uh, blanket it within a health fair because people wanted the medicine, they want the experience, they want to have that test, but they were not allowed, you know, due to stigma and a lot of own cultural differences within communities to be able to participate within that. So I know that it, there's just not a lot of there's a lot of barriers and obstacles, but I just didn't see if we have ever thought about perhaps like going in and working with faith-based leaders where they have an influence with large congregations of people, which then it's just then a catapult into the you know, local government, and then you work your way up from there. Thank you. We also have some, uh, Lucia, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. If you wanna go on audio or video, I saw a great comment from you, but you don't need to again. Everyone, um, my name is Lucia, and I've known Alfie from many, many, many years Hi. ago. <laughs> Hi, Alfie. Hi. How are I you? I just so happened to come across the email and um, the the post, and I actually joined the group. And what I'm thinking is that yes, it, everything that that you've all said is completely true, but it also begins before the body begins to manifest symptoms you know, and it's a matter of um, women and men knowing themselves, knowing the body, what type of a body do we have, you know, what foods are we able to eat, and I am about to finish my certification in Ayurveda, and I am beginning to incorporate a business model in which I'm going to have a scholarship for one person every six months so I can work with them one-on-one -on -one to help them get to know themselves, you know, how, what they can eat and when they cannot eat. So, um, and, and it's just making the con connections to be able to serve those underrepresented um, groups. Thank you, that's a, a, a um love what you're doing and I actually want to learn more about that and um, thank you for also letting us know about that like I think that there's so many great probably, pe people in the industry here and, and um, 
it's great to hear what you're doing in terms of like uh, your own um, decision making around it. So thank you. So I think that could inspire others. If you, if someone else is doing something similar, we could all give each other ideas here. It's all about co-creation, collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, sharing. Um, I have a question. Yeah, Natalie. Alfie, just talking about mental health and also whoever else wants to weigh in and to, I mean, that is your background. I just want to learn more about what you do and, and the needs in regards to mental health, especially at this time where we are facing such a blatant crisis. Um, so yeah, anyone, but specifically Dr. Alfie. Yeah, so I tell you the two, in a nutshell, the two crises I think communities of color, black in particular, are facing. And let me be, I just wanna clarify, when I say black, I'm also talking about black Latinx populations, right? Because you can be of any race and be Latino, or Latina, um, and many of my peers who are Latinx look like me. Um, so until they open their mouths and tell you where they're from, you don't necessarily know that they're not African-American or black. So that's important to say is also it's Caribbean black folks and black African immigrants. So I'm thinking about all of those populations of folks. And the two pandemics I think these folks are facing right now, myself included, are the pandemics of racism, gotta say it, right? Like the structural racism, the, the structural discrimination, I, I tell everybody, right, along with COVID. So I just saw something this afternoon. I just wanted to burst into tears in the LA Times that uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, excuse me, Pacific Islander populations in LA are dying from COVID at rates, I think it was five times higher than Black folks. And we were the ones who, you know, have the, like, the worst outcomes um, in terms of once people get infected. Um, and so all of those things, in my experience right now are weighing so heavily on black people because it's not just about this moment in time and then I'm almost done because it's really not, I think it's really not hard to articulate it. It is the cumulative effect of hundreds and hundreds of years of this pandemic of racism. And so I think what many of the people I encounter, I have a teeny tiny clinical practice. Um, a lot more of my work is like social media and TV and stuff like that. Um, and wonderful opportunities to be in small communities like this virtually. But what I'm hearing people talk about is their fear. What I'm hearing people talk about is their fatigue. There is this thing called racial battle fatigue. That is a real thing for people of color. It's a real thing for black people. Because you're just tired. You're tired from not just today, but you're tired from all of it. Right? And then you have all these wonderful cosplays. <laughs> like, yup, my amen corner. You have people, <laughs> um, you know, like the colleagues on here, one of the things I was thinking about is how are they taking care of themselves, right? Every one of you, what are you doing to take care of yourself? And then I think about the young people, the activists, all of these folks out there protesting in the street. I had the wonderful opportunity. I just have to shout her out because she's so beautiful and she's so bright. The young woman who played Pearl on Little Fires Everywhere from Hulu. I talked with her on Friday on Instagram Live. And she's got this whole big platform that she runs with Gen Z, right? So these are like under 20 year olds. They're activists. How are these young people taking care of their mental health? And I think for so many of us, we don't prioritize it. And so what ends up happening is people are already tired from COVID. They're already tired from the news. They're already tired from racial battle fatigue and being out there protesting and they have no way to replenish themselves. So all the work that my colleagues, you all are doing here and, and Shira giving us the opportunity to be on this call tonight or it's night where I am, I'm on the East Coast in the DC area. This is like energizing, right? I'll get off of here, I'll probably cry a little bit after we do a close the meditation, but it's a, re it's a release because I get to see and hear all these amazing people talking about what they do to support others. At the same time though, I'm always mindful of how is each of you, how are you dealing with your own mental health? Are you taking a beat? Are you taking time? Are you taking care of yourself? So for me, I mean, that's all of us, inclusive of all races, ethnicities, inclusive of all genders, inclusive of queer, you know, non-gender conforming for all of us. What are we doing to make sure that we center our mental health? Because I think that's the thing that we sometimes forget. We talk about physical health, but I think we forget, for me, that the root of all of it, if that brain is not healthy, it's hard to get anything else to be healthy. So I appreciate the question, and I just would push out there that I hope every single one of you within the sound of my voice is, is doing something to prioritize your own mental health because it's critical. I love that for all our guests. Before we get into our breakout rooms in like seven minutes or so, like if all of our special guests could answer that, like what are they doing for themselves to continue to be giving 
when they they themselves are probably experiencing the trauma as well and that give and take like i i can't even imagine that if someone wants to start dr milo i'll go to you <laughs> well um as i added to the uh to the chat there ben and jerry are the homies so what i mean by that uh uh that is a culturally uh representative way of expressing my connection to ice cream, just for the record there. So, um, so essentially my approach is to have um, self-care tactics, survival kit, if you will, in different areas. So Ben and Jerry's kind of like the go-to was like, you know what, damn, I just need some strawberry cheesecake today. Um, other times and in an ongoing sense, because obviously I can't eat ice cream all the time as much as I would like to, um, I also pray. Um, I will be physically active and exercise outside. I'll do a lot of social connection, um, obviously to the extent that we can these days. Um, but I also, I want to be really, really clear here because this actually ties into the whole purpose and the crux of the day is that self-care is a mindset and not an action. So it's one thing for us to talk about, let's buy these things, Ben and Jerry's, again, they get all my money too. Um, it's one thing for us to talk about different actions, even behaviors of going to therapy, but unless we start to understand that we deserve to take care of ourselves as we are survivors and thrivers in systems that don't even want us to exist in the first place, unless, we've, unless we start to understand that we deserve that, then all of this conversation, all these continuing conversations are moot and pointless. It starts with the shift of understanding that you deserve to take care of yourself. And that again, it's a mindset, not an action. So you can practice self-care essentially wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Um, and even like as I'm conducting therapy, I'm slowing my breath, I'm taking care of myself and I'm being kind to myself. So then that way I can radiate that out to my clients. Um, so that's what I'll share. I loved that so much. That was so amazing. Thank you. Um, I just want to piggyback off that. Um, one of the ways that I take care of, I mean, this is like a hundred percent of the time self-care. Um, you know, I, I love that you talked about like believing and kind of stepping into your own belief system of, of deserving um, affirmations. Um, you know, I do a lot of 12 step programs just because, uh, you know, like I shared earlier, I, I sh have struggled with addiction. And so, you know, I use something like a 12 step program to really like get connected with other people um, who also have struggled with, with different addictions. And um, that's a way that, you know, I show up to a meeting, I share about how I feel, um, I hear other people and that's, that's a really huge form of self care for myself. And then I can kind of show up for other people. Um, you know, and I love, I love how, you know, it's, it's not all about like meditation and, and yoga and this and that, but I mean, those things are important too. Like, you know, I, you know, just recently started taking bubble baths and I'm, you know, I just turned 30, you know, I took a bubble bath for the first time, like, like a month ago, you know, and that was so healing for me. Um, and so it's like little moments like that. Um, but you know, just, I just, I loved, um, just hearing, uh, everything from tonight and, you know, I think it's just so important just to like love ourselves and to, you know, know what our needs are. Like one person might not enjoy doing yoga, but maybe connecting with, um, you know, like-minded people and talking, you know, like I said, in a 12-step group might work for them. So really just knowing yourself and knowing what self-care practice is going to work for you, um, you know, is so important. Thank you. And I wanted, I wanted to say really quickly, if, if there's time, um, because I think the conversation that Dr. Milo and Jennifer are having is it's so wonderful, right? Understanding where we have to do the work and taking care of ourselves and being able to see ourselves through a lens outside of whatever society has placed on us and how we've labeled ourselves and kind of doing that work. But in our ability to do that as practitioners, um, we can see our clients or our patients in a light that maybe they have not been able to see themselves in ever before. And just being witnessed in that way, I think is very powerful and very healing. So taking care of yourself, self-practice, changing that mindset is not just beneficial to us, but the communities and the people that we end up serving. 
That's all. Does anyone else, Sandrina, Portia, Betty, anyone else want to add to this? this yeah, part? I'll chime in. So I had to write down a few things because my, my wellness routine has changed a lot since the quarantine has started. I used to have a pretty intense, um, I shouldn't say intense, maybe disciplined yoga and meditation practice every morning and um, throughout my day. But I haven't really been able to, uh, there's been a lot of changes in my life, transitions, as I'm sure a lot of people can, can um, relate to. So I've been trying to listen inward and, and hear kind of where I'm being called. So where that's taken me is a lot of time outside, a lot of listening to the birds, listening to the rustling of the trees, going on long nature walks, um, trying to allow positive uh, thinking in my life more, just noticing that I have a negative bias and a tendency to go negative quite a bit. And it, usually it's kind of directed at myself. So trying to notice those behaviors and um, I'm, I'm not trying to do a lot with them other than try to just notice them and reverse the change or if that may or reverse the behavior if that makes sense so i'm not telling myself i'm doing anything wrong but just trying to notice it's happening and, and, and to be more positive and then um the other two things that i feel are important to share is creativity i've been um, listening to my personal creative flow that's coming um, out of my unique person so that's looked like macrame that's looked like painting drawing writing um, and then the last thing is, I, it kind of ties in with what Milo was saying, I was really happy to hear him say this, um, is, is sitting doing nothing. So this is kind of a meditation practice, but also it can just go through, it, you can do this anytime do, during your day. It can be kind of sitting here, um, wondering what to do next. I might finish my lunch and be thinking about going for a walk or something. Instead of rushing to transition to the next thing, just sitting and being present to myself as I am without trying or needing to be something else. That's really powerful. I'm just shaking my head because Betty, you'd speak in my language. I tell people that all the time, give yourself space. I call it extending yourself some grace between things. Even if it's 30 seconds, you stop, give yourself a, a, a moment to breathe and then you go to that next thing instead of this continuous loop of activity where you never give your brain a break. So I just am so happy that you said that. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna take that in and do that for myself too. I've been practicing um, just really a radical level of rest. Um, I've had to, you know, finishing graduate school and being licensed and starting a business and, you know, being in business for myself for three years and, you know, living in, you know, downtown LA and just like all of that it requires a certain level of your personhood and once this pandemic started and the social uprisings were happening and managing the practice and all of this I, I recognized that I was quickly careening toward a real sense of burnout and I was like before I get to that point then I, I need to be very honest and I need to take a step back from all the things that I think um, you know are very useful and I value and I just need to to take a pause and I need to rest and I need to honor that deep level of rest and so like right now my wife and I we are completely remapping our lives we're like we're just gonna we're gonna start fresh and so I'm being really honest about what rest looks like and um, recalibrating my life so that um, I'm, I'm, I'm practicing an even deeper level of consistent rest and rejuvenation um, but some of my smaller day-to-day -day practices are Tai Chi, or mindfulness, um, breath work, um, tarot cards, um, and really just connecting with, uh, connecting with my community in ways that uh, feels, you know, as, as close to real and inner life as possible, even though we're all on Zooms now. So, you know, really relying, relying on community, I think a lot of times um, we tend to want to isolate and separate when, when things like this are happening. And the fact that we are currently in very much in isolation kind of exacerbates that. So I'm taking time to connect with community and to rest and to realize that, um, that you know, I, I have to practice an oxygen mask theory. Like I have to make sure that my oxygen mask is on before I can help others and continue with that like that's my that's my best work right now I love that I know Centrina you were saying some amazing things in the chat if you, if you want to add over video or audio there you go 
Oh, <laughs> I was just saying that, um, yeah, pausing and resting is so important. Um, my personal self-care has shifted during this pandemic, social uprising. Like, um, I started feeling a lot of anxiety creep in subconsciously. I would feel fine during the day, you know, but then at nighttime I couldn't sleep. I would wake up with severe heart palpitations out of nowhere. And I realized that my nervous system was um, being, things are being suppressed during the day and then coming out at nighttime in my body, my brain trying to process. So, you know, I had to check out from social media for periods of time, not watch the news at all because that was the source of where the anxiety was coming from. Um, getting back to eating better um, and choosing foods that I knew that my body was uh, going to love and respond well to uh, because I do have a various food sensitivities. Um, going for walks, being in nature is like amazing for my being as well. And uh, connecting with other people, having conversations, texts, FaceTimes, um, seeing other people and sharing how I'm feeling, what I'm dealing with in that moment, and also hearing from them is also very therapeutic uh, for me as well. And also, um, I've been seeing patients uh, currently during this time as well, and that has brought me so much joy uh, to connect with them, to be able to listen to them, um, and to be able to share with them what I do personally and what uh, has helped me and model that same behavior for them as well um, has been uh, an interesting and very nice experience um, to let them know too that you can get through this time, you can uh, still take care of yourself, you can eat well, you can be intentional about your well being um, during uncertainty. So those are some of the things that I do. Um, and prayer is a big thing for me, a very strong uh, spiritual walk. And so praying and listening um, to how I'm being led and guided um, is also one of my main staples. So love that. I, I know we're going to be getting into, and thank you for sharing so much, Sandrina. Um, we're getting into our breakout rooms where, um, and I did, there's one thing I didn't mention, which is like something I see, and I think it is a responsibility as like a white privileged woman. When I see spaces like other women I know who are white that are building their meditation, this, or mindfulness, blah, blah, blah. Like if I don't see other people in the space that don't look like me saying something and like bringing it up because um, it's really hard to see these spaces where I'm like, it's just white people. And I'm like, does anyone notice this? Partially, it's like they're not hiring facilitators that are, you know, uh, black or people of color. Um, and then there's there's the lack of accessibility. It's like completely whitewashed. So just as we go into the breakout rooms, I know I just like dumped this. But like, what is your take on that? Because I, I'm trying to take it on as my responsibility to bring something up. But um, there needs to be a greater awareness. And, and do you think that this time now is bringing that awareness? at all? Do you see a shift happening in these um, companies or brands that have typically just had like such a lack of diversity? And, and at this point, is it too late? Should we just start new spaces, right? Like, instead of saying to them like, oh, now you have um, a get out of jail free card, even though you haven't been open to that before or done the right thing. Does anyone have a take on that? And then we'll do the breakout session, sorry. It's a great question. I had to do it today. Somebody invited me to, to be a part of a, actually Dr. Milo's on it too. Um, and uh, I, you know, I had to take a deep breath. I think for those of us who are in, because in some way we're all at some point in a position of privilege. So were this the space where as a heterosexual woman, I was seeing a lack of diversity around queer LGBTQ folks. I would feel like I needed to take responsibility and ownership and say, wait a minute, I don't see no queer, I don't see no visibly LGBTQ, y'all need to do something. I think in this, the, what I had to do today was take a deep breath because I'm a featured speaker on this event and they had a science portion of the event and there are literally no people of color. There's one, there's like six speakers, five are men, one's a woman, nobody is of color. And I was just like, I don't want to have to do this. I hope it doesn't have negative repercussions, but I'm going to do it quietly. So I emailed the president of the organization. I was like, I don't know if you noticed, know 
but y'all need to put some brown pe- black and brown people and some more women on this science piece because you're making it look like we don't know how to be science when nothing is further from the truth. So I think it's just one of those things where if we do have privilege here, it all, I won't speak for myself, I always love it when I don't have to be, I'm okay being an angry black woman. I wrote, wrote a whole blog post about that. Anger is an emotion just like a whole bunch of other ones. So I'm okay with my anger. But I don't want to always have to be the one to say it. And it helps me if I have my allies, right? Somebody was saying earlier, I think it might have been Betty, I'm not sure, or Sandrina, avoiding performative allyship. I, I want other people to take responsibility. That's real allyship. When they put their neck on the line for, and I don't have to say it, I'm just like, oh, thank God. And it, it, so it just makes it better for me. But I don't see enough people doing it. And that's why you, when you do it, trust me, a lot of us are really happy that you speak up because that means we don't have to do it and get punished for it. Because we get punished when we speak up. You know, other people, they don't get punished when they speak up. So I appreciate it, but it doesn't happen enough. All right. I know a lot of people are logging off. I did want to do these breakout rooms because I do think I want to leave with some calls to action, like uh, things that we could actually do from this conversation based on everything we've been sharing and talking about. So we're going to quickly go five minutes. So like 540 to 545, and then we're going to do a closing meditation. So as many of you that can stay on, please do, because it'd be really great to, um, once again, not just talk, but you know, create something like this. Uh, So Natalie, I know is going to put us all in like random breakout rooms and then we'll okay. have five minutes till 5 45 and then come out of it and then um choose someone from the room to then speak to what came of it that an action that we should take from this that's cool i said natalie if you want to do the breakout rooms right now awesome
circle and taking that small step that can then ripple out. So not being overwhelmed by the grandiose of, of solving the issue, but starting where you can and trying to do it from a place of, of non-judgment. Eugenia, did you want to add your point? Because it was so perfect as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, it, it was, uh, I was really taken with Anthony's um, conversation about starting where you are, starting with family, um, and sort of um, listening to intergenerational modalities of, of healing. Um, uh, my mom is a nurse, and she comes from a land of curanderas, and, it, and it's always been really striking to sort of um, think about ways in which, you know, we have, you know, continued to heal ourselves as uh, to think about, um, you know, intergenerational connections, but starting from the place that where you are, I thought was so good. Amazing. Um, I don't know if any other groups, I know we're wrapping up. This is like, you know, I thank you for the, all the last folks who decide to hang with us. We appreciate it. Um, does anyone else have anything to share takeaways? Because for my group, I don't know if um, someone wants to speak to that. Uh, we had some great thoughts also. Jonathan maybe can speak to it or Tara. Um, sure, something that, something that I was bringing up was just acknowledging that we are part of a system and, whatever, and that those around us are part of a system. So whatever that system is and some systems, some systems can be actually helpful. Um, but helping to bring awareness to those around us that this is something that has put in place. This is something that, that's been acted upon, but it doesn't always have to be that way. And that we also need to reevaluate those systems. Nothing has been designed forever. Um, our existence has actually been fairly short. So taking that moment of introspection, but more importantly, educating those around us or helping to bring awareness that, hey, this is a thing that we're all part of, that we're all part of. Is it working? Is it not working? Are there parts that we want to change? Yeah, I love that. And I, I put this down from Dr. Milo, um, communal uh, learning for communal healing. I think that community and education is so important. That's kind of what we're doing here with these conversations, even with the other America. Um, it's really this like interactive um, virtual learning space. And it's like, how do we really push the barriers and boundaries around that, uh, but towards action? So, yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Milo. Well. Another quote, <laughs> another great quote to come out of this. Um, I know this has been like, uh, it's been almost two hours, so I really appreciate it. And we're going to end it. Unless anyone uh, has anything, last words, anything to share as we wrap things up. I'll... Hi, Shira. I just had a, a one quick thing to add, please, from our yes. group. So uh, collectively, um, I'm also Asian. I'm a student at Emperor's. I'm entering my second year. And um, that's all really exciting. And what we got to in our group was about how uh, on campus, we have like a Google Hangout group. And one idea that's been suggested in there is um, acupuncturists for social justice. So setting up a tent and working with the city of LA to get a permit so that we can actually be there in the street and offer, you know, possibly auricular acupuncture from, you know, more senior students. And then younger people can fit in, um, wherever they can, you know, whether it's with water or like sanitation or anything else. And that could also be a really great way of integrating what I already know versus waiting until, you know, a special day in the clinic to get that opportunity. Um, and then, you know, show up for people in the streets. Thank you. Yeah, having like groups in colleges or in schools, like after school programs around mindfulness. I mean, I know that, um, who's that director does it with his, with t like uh, transcendental meditation. But I feel like if there could be after school programs that are created that students create themselves instead of other people from the outside coming in to implement it could be really powerful also. All right, anyone else? Final words? Yeah, I think that uh, also now that we are, you know, mostly online now, really taking advantage of worldwide meetings and getting to know other people, connecting that way, and learning, uh, you know, different trains of thought. Is it Sela, who had something really amazing, uh, and is very, um, you know, active in our the other America chat. So thank you so much for being here to share that. If anyone is interested in working with uh, a group of Atlanta teens here in LA tomorrow morning.
please reach out. Definitely. That's awesome. And you could always get in touch with me. I hope you know that too. And I'm happy to help. Um, any other shares, feedback? <laughs> um, I came in really late and just heard kind of the end um, where Dr. Adolfi was talking about um, the fact that like she doesn't want to always be the one to have to bring up this issue and and it was just a good like the issue that there wasn't enough people of color on the science side of the presentation thing that um that it's good to know like recognizing our own privileges and then see like because sometimes i can run away from conflict and i by hearing her say that it reminded me that like maybe it's not always my turn to run away. It's somebody else, not run away, but somebody else could take a break because they're probably a little more tired than I am with the amount of privilege that I have. So that was a good reminder. So thank you for that. Love that. It's, you know, these conversations aren't easy to have, but they're, they're important, they're needed. So thank you for that acknowledgement and recognition. Can I just, can yeah. I speak to what Christina said? Okay. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to um, just piggyback on what Christina said and just say that at least for white people, it is the most important thing to put our healing on the front burner around any of our triggers or our power issues so that we can step into places of power when we need to protect people of color, stand up for people of color. Um, all of these issues are on our shoulders because we are the least tired but our traumas and our triggers get in the way. Um, and so our personal healing is actually really, really important to prioritize in order to further the work so that we aren't adding our emotional um, burden and fragility to the entire, um, the entire problem and then placing it on the shoulders of the people who are already carrying it the most. Um, so just wanted to add that. Thank you. Yeah, on that note, that was, Totally well said. A lot of egos, ego comes up, right? That's why you got to do the work. So you put your ego at the door, throw that ego out. Ah, so Natalie, uh, all right, anyone else? I feel like I want to make sure, but I, I, other than that, I think that we'll go to Natalie for our closing meditation with this beautiful group of people we have here today, tonight, wherever you are. Yes, thank you all for, I'm so filled with uh, and um, light. So thank you all for being here and for joining and for contributing all your wisdom. And I thought I would just take us out in a, another bit of breathing exercise so we can focus on um, union. And we've heard so much that is going to, I know, resonate with us throughout um, the rest of the week. And um, maybe just union of our breath with our intention of our mind, our body, and our spirit. So wherever you are, just grounding yourself in your seat or if you're standing, grounding yourself in your feet and allowing your feet to feel the earth, whether you're standing or sitting and allowing the eyes to close, if that's comfortable or just finding a gaze in front of you, wherever you are right now. Taking a deep breath in through your nose as you fill your belly and let your belly button fill out towards the world and bringing the intention here in to send this breath to the mind and our mind, our ability to think, sending this breath our ability to calm our mind and process all of the information that we have received. Taking a deep breath in. And as you exhale, letting out any sighs or sounds from your body, from your mind. Uh, allowing yourself to listen to that sigh exiting your body. And we take another deep inhale as we root ourselves in our sits bones or our feet and we reach the top of our head up towards the sky. Taking this breath now in for our body. As we inhale, feeling our body, maybe there's a tingling, maybe you wanna rotate your neck and just letting the body feel this breath as you inhale and exhale. Allowing yourself to yawn if you have to, anything that vacates your body as you exhale. And as we inhale, I'll invite us now to focus on the spirit, the divine, the sacred around us, our ancestors, our spirit guides, and all who have allowed us to be in this sacred circle, in this community, 
taking a deep breath in with gratitude. Sending that breath to your spirit, the strength within you. And exhaling, letting any noise vacate your body. Ah, listening to that spirit within, that guiding force, that intuition, that voice of wisdom and honoring that voice with one final breath, deep inhaling through your nose, letting that breath fill your body, visualizing this cool new energy entering your nostrils. And as you exhale gently, letting the lips part, exhaling, and slowly letting the eyes flutter back open into the space in the circle with gratitude for your breath, our human right. Thank you, Shira. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks to all our panelists who's here still. I want to Dr. Alpie for being an amazing co-host. We'll be doing this again. <laughs> um, Natalie for helping produce this with me and Jonathan, of course, where are you at? Um, for you know all your work as well, being part of this vision. Uh, Dr. Milo, Karina, Betty, Jennifer. Um, I think this is like <laughs> everyone had to <laughs> depart, but um, so appreciate all the rest who were, oh, then where, Karina. Oh yeah, I said Karina. I'm like thinking I'm like missing people. Um, I'm gonna be sending an email with everyone's names and everyone's links so you can all follow each other, support each other. And we're gonna definitely take the uh, action items today and figure something out. Uh, there's a big idea I have with some other folks in the wellness space that I will be announcing shortly and looking for collaborators and ideas. I'm very excited about it. It's not there yet. There's no point of breaking up, but it's brewing. Um, so yeah, let's keep this conversation going and hopefully maybe do this once a month, once every month and a half. I don't know. Let us know how we can support you and what you're doing. Fill any gaps. You know where to find uh, me at Cheryl Lazar, share at Peace Inside Live. But once again, we'll include everyone else's info in the emails. So many blessings and thank you for your space and time and energy tonight. So appreciate it. Appreciate it all. Thank you. Bye.